I want to begin by speaking about the preservation of the Quran and the Sunnah. As believers, we know that our deen, our religion, is confined to the two specific sources, and that is the Quran, the Word of God, and the beautiful teachings of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From time to time, the Almighty sent prophets and anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam, and all of them engaged in propagating that message from the Almighty. We know that the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the final messenger. There is no prophet to come after him. And in order for us to remain steadfast on the beautiful teachings of the Almighty, as well as the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, we have to continue to connect to this great legacy. And therefore, we've seen from time to time, from era to era, there are great personalities who have preserved and protected the message of both the Quran and the beautiful teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. And both are important, by the way. There are many calls today where people are engaging in saying that the Quran is sufficient for us. In fact, we find the narration in Mishkat al-Masabih where the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, said one of the signs of the last hour, meaning the day of judgment, is that there will be certain people who will claim to say the Quran is sufficient for us. And we know that the Quran definitely is the primary source of our guidance. But the beautiful teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, the authentic narrations and reports from the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are in fact an explanation of the Holy Quran. We find Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, أَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Obey and follow Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala the Almighty as well as the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A scholar gave a beautiful but simple example. He said, when you look at a bird, it flies with two wings. And you'll never see a bird flying properly with only one wing. So similarly, we want to fly in terms of connecting with the Almighty. And how do we do that? By having the Qur'an as well as the beautiful teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. These are two wings that will elevate us to the best of success in this world as well as in the everlasting life of the hereafter. So from time to time there were personalities and this is one of the personalities that we will be uh, looking at Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy upon him. Allah selected him. Allah chose him. And he made the efforts to preserve and protect some of the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. And today, many scholars, many believers, they benefit from his great works. This is only one of his good books that uh, has reached us. But in fact, he has written a number of books and all of these great books, they are point of references uh, for uh, Muslims in general and experts uh, in a specific manner. So before we look into Imam Muhammad, we have to understand that his Mu'atta, Imam Muhammad's Mu'atta is connected to Imam Malik's great work, which is the Mu'atta itself. So before we get into either of the Mu'attas, we have to know this great personality. And we know there are four main jurists that have been popular over time. And uh, we generally say they are Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad. May Allah have mercy upon each and every one of them. These are not only the jurists. There are many jurists who had their own schools, but these four became mainstream and well-known. So Imam Malik is one of the great jurists. And who is Imam Malik? His name is Malik ibn Anas. And he is a descendant of Abu Amir radiallahu anhu, according to many historians, meaning that he comes from a lineage that is very noble. He comes from a lineage where we find Sahaba radiallahu anhu. We find the companions who learned directly from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. Imam Malik was born in the 95th year of Hijrah, meaning 95 years after the Prophet sallam, migrated from Mecca to Medina. And Imam Malik passed away in the year 179 of Hijrah. He is a great noble scholar. In fact, he has many titles. 
He is known for his piety. He is known for his great work. For example, one of the titles that is given to Imam Malik is Imam Udari al Hijra, which basically means he's the Imam of the abode of migration. And when we talk about the abode of migration, it refers to none other than the blessed city of Medina Tul Munawwara. In fact, people say that if you want to understand the fiqh and the jurisprudence of the Sahaba and those who came after, meaning the successors, then you must study the works of Imam Malik rahimahullah. Why? Number one, he had a lot of love for the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. He had a lot of respect for the Prophet Sallallahu And there are many things that could be said about his respect, his love and his attachment to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu For example, he was not originally from, um, uh, from Medina, but he lived there. He resided there. He emigrated there. Now, there were many a times where people, because he was a very popular jurist, people came from far and wide to learn from him. And one of the things that is mentioned about Imam Malik is that people would tie their camels with their belongings and they would exhaust their journeys to get to Imam Malik to learn from him, rahimahullah. So when it came to Imam Malik, he had so much love and respect for the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him that he refused to walk with sandals in the city of Medina. Now obviously when we look at this, this looks like a little bit of exaggeration and I would advise none of you walk in Medina uh, with bare feet. Uh, rather, this was his personal uh, attachment with the Prophet Muhammad or his method of respect. Now, Imam Malik also um, he would narrate the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, in the city of Medina. Now, many a times people would come to him and invite him to their towns, their cities. And like today, we, we invite speakers and teachers and scholars from various parts of the world to attend our events and, and conferences and programs. So it was very similar in those days where Imam Malik was approached by various individuals from different towns and regions and they would say, you are the great Imam of Medina. So we would invite you to come and attend and participate in one of our programs and events. And he always declined. And one of the reasons why he would decline is that he wanted his death to occur in the blessed city of Medina. And he said, if I end up going to your venue out of the city of Medina, perhaps death might come to me. And Allah makes a mention in the Quran, no one knows their place of death. No one knows their place of death. In Allah indahu ilmu sa'a. Allah knows the day of judgment. Allah knows uh, the, the time of death for every individual. No one knows their land of death. Nevertheless, Imam Malik refused because he wanted to stay and he wanted his death to occur in the city of Medina. People would approach him and say, take us for Hajj, take us for pilgrimage, you can guide us so that we, we, we perform the pilgrimage in accordance to the Sunnah. And again, he would refuse. He said, I performed my Hajj, my Fard Hajj, it's over, it's done, I don't want to leave the city of Medina. And we know that he was uh, buried in the city of Medina Tul Munawwara. And um, there is a weak narration, and many scholars have attributed this weak narration to Imam Malik. What is this weak narration? The Prophet Sallallahu says, a time will come where knowledge of the religion will become scarce. But there will be certain people who will embrace my teachings and they will spread those teachings. So many ulama and many scholars, they say Imam Malik is one of those individuals who continued the legacy and preserved and protected the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. Now again, why are we talking about Imam Malik when the session is about Imam Muhammad? Because in order for us to understand the mu'atta of Imam Muhammad, we have to know where the original source is. So Imam Malik, <coughs> he wrote a book called Mu'atta. He wrote a book called Mu'atta. We're going to get into the details of, as to what Mu'atta actually means. 
and how is, why he chose this name. But basically, he, he had heard many narrations from many of his teachers. Some scholars and historians have written that he had over a thousand teachers. And many of these were great uh, companions or students of the companions, tabi'un. And Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he collected these narrations that he had memorized and he had heard from his teachers. And from a hundred thousand hadith, he ended up putting in his first version or first copy of his mu'atta, he confined it to 10,000. But then over time, over a period of 40 years, he kept checking those narrations, looking for different chains, and talking to various other authorities of religion. And finally, he, he confined the book to approximately 500. In some versions, there's about 700 narrations. And he said very confidently that these narrations that I have put into this book, Mu'atta, they are authentic, they are reliable, and uh, they are trustworthy. And that's the compilation of his great work, Mu'atta. In fact, many scholars say he was the first scholar in history to comprise or bring about a book which had authentic narrations. And we know this is even before Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Malik lived before uh, Imam Bukhari. So, for uh, one of the statements, as we could see on the slide as well, is that his Mu'atta was known as the most reliable after the Qur'an because it had authentic narrations in there. Um, now, there are many unique features of the Mu'atta of Imam Malik, but one particular one is that it's known for its thulathiyat. What does that mean? That means in order for a narration to be reliable, you have to have a reliable chain that leads up to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So there are generally three components. One is what you call the text or the words of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. We call this the metan, meaning the text, the actual words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Then you have the rawi, you have the narrator, and then you have the chain of the narrators. So that means who's hearing from who. And then it goes all the way to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. So I've heard from my teacher, my teacher heard from his teacher, his teacher heard from his teacher, and it goes all the way, it goes all the way to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Oh, okay, okay. Should I, okay. So, the chain is also one component. So what is the unique feature of Imam Malik's Mu'atta? is that he has thulathiyat. Thulathiyat means there's only three rawis, there's only three narrators that lead up to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what is that thulathi? It's called the golden chain. So Imam Malik hears from his teacher who is Nafi'. And Nafi' heard from his teacher who is Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Umar, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar, he heard directly from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. So there's only three individuals between Imam Malik and the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. And this is what is called the golden chain. So a number of narrations that are in the Mu'atta of Imam Malik have this golden chain from Malik. He heard from Nafi' and Nafi' heard from Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Umar heard from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so let's talk about the meaning. Muwatta comes from the root wata ayati'u, which basically literally means to tread upon. To tread upon. Also, what it means is, for those of us who know a little bit about farming, when the harvest takes place and the, um, the vegetation is collected, many a times you have to take away the seeds from what we would call the residue or the, the things that are not so useful for the human consumption. So they separate it. And one way, one method of doing that is that they would put the, the leaves or the branches or whatever the vegetation was onto the ground and they would get the animals to stomp on them. 
And by that what will happen, they, they would separate the seeds or the grains from the residue. And then they would blow a strong wind and it would separate completely the seeds on one side and the leaves or the extra residue on the other. So why did Imam, uh, Imam Malik name his work Mu'atta? Because it took him 40 years to write it. And over 40 years, he looked at the transmission of the chains. He looked at the rawis. He looked at the text. He analyzed and he checked and he kept reviewing until he came up with the final version of his book of uh, Hadith. And it, it was basically made easy. And it, it went through this entire process of uh, balance and check until finally the final version came forward. So that's why he named his book Mu'atta. And many scholars, they write, many historians write that this was the first time anyone named, any scholar of hadith named their book or their collection Mu'atta. Before this, it was known as Jami' or Musnad, um, Sunan. So these were the names that were present, but this was the first time. This uh, name was ever chosen, and again by Imam uh, Malik rahimahullah. So now let's get towards uh, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani. So Imam Malik, it, it, this was his general habit. He would sit in the Prophet wasallam's masjid, and he would narrate the book. He would narrate the hadith that were compiled in this book. And people would come from far and wide. Historians write that at one time, there would be thousands of people who were sitting in the dars or the lesson of Imam Malik rahimahullah. And they saw his passion, they saw his dedication, and they felt a spiritual connection with the way Imam Malik transmitted his narrations. And there's many stories about Imam Malik as well, how passionate he was to narrate hadith and how much respect he had for that. In one story that is recorded in his biography, Imam Malik was teaching and a scorpion came and bit him approximately 16 times. And Imam Malik did not stop his lesson. He continued teaching the lesson. People noticed that his face was turning different colors and he, we could tell that there was some disturbance, but he kept teaching. And when the students after the lesson was over, they asked, and he then explained that a scorpion bit me, but the respect for the words of the Prophet ﷺ was that I didn't want to break the lesson or stop the lesson. Again, this was his version of respecting and honoring the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and his words. So Imam Malik, thousands of students, and they would come, there would be two types. One would be they would just come and benefit from his lessons. They would take some knowledge and they would leave. There were others who would want to hear the entire book, meaning all five to seven hundred narrations directly from the author or the compiler of these narrations, Imam Malik rahimahullah, and they would not only listen to these narrations, they would memorize them. This was a second category. They would memorize them and then they would relate those narrations off of memory back to Imam Malik rahimahullah. And then Imam Malik would give them the permission to convey to others the Mu'atta. Now there were various, there's actually some scholars say there are 16 versions of the Mu'atta from the students of Imam Malik. Others say they go up to 30 versions. But nevertheless, the idea is his students, they compiled their own Mu'attas in accordance to their fiqh, in accordance to their personal opinions, their personal uh, perspectives, either on a specific uh, subject matter or in general all the narrations they heard from Imam Malik rahimahullah. So one of those individuals was none other than Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah. So who is Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah? His name, his lineage is Muhammad son of Hassan, son of Farqad al-Shaybani. So Shaybani refers to a specific tribe or a clan. And uh, it was a well-known, very well-respected clan. He was originally from Damascus, meaning his father was born in Damascus, in Syria, in Sham, in a locality called Harsata. 
But then his father, he was a military um, army general. And it's mentioned in the biography of Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani that his father wanted him to be a military general as well. But he showed no interest. Rather, Muhammad's interest was in learning the deen. His interest was in learning religion. Why? Because his father had relocated from Syria to Iraq. And Iraq was a hub for learning and teaching. It was a hustling, bustling city, uh, the Baghdad, etc., Kufa. These were well-known cities where uh, Islamic heritage, Islamic academic works, they were at their peak. So Muhammad as a youngster, as a young child, was very impressed by the academics of Islam and he didn't show too much interest in the military or the army that uh, his father was trying to put him on the path of. So uh, his father uh, gave him the blessings and encouraged him to, to learn and strive in what he wanted to, to seek. Uh, he ended up learning from the scholars of Kufa, and one of them was none other than Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. It's mentioned in his biography that he was only his student for about two years. And then Imam Abu Hanifa had passed away. So he continued learning from another star student of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and that was Imam Abu Yusuf. And many a times when you look in the Hanafi uh, books of fiqh and jurisprudence, you find these words, sahibain, shaykhain. So what sahibain refers to is Imam Muhammad al-Hasan al-Shaybani, as well as Imam Abu Yusuf. Because many of their opinions would differ from their teacher, Imam Abu Hanifa, but they would agree on a certain matter. So when you look in the Hanafi text uh, or, or manuals of fiqh, you find Imam Abu Hanifa's opinion is this, but the Sahibain, their opinion is this. And Sahibain refers to Imam Muhammad and Imam Abu Yusuf. And then there are some pl places in the books of Hanafi fiqh where it talks about Shaykhain. And Shaykhain refers to where Imam Muhammad and Imam Abu Hanifa are in agreement and Imam Abu Yusuf has his own opinion. So these are recorded generally in the books of Hanafi jurisprudence. So Imam Muhammad was a star student of both Imam Abu Hanifa as well as uh, Imam Abu Yusuf rahimahullah. And in many of his books, Imam Muhammad Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah, he has made reference to both Imam Abu Hanifa as well as Imam Abu Yusuf uh, in his books. Now, when we look at the, the legacy or the tradition of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf, and Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani, we find that most of their perspectives, they go back to the Sahabi Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. And we know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, really praised Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He actually, you know, as we say today, like a blank check. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was basically given a blank check. What do I mean by that? He was told, the Sahaba were told, that if you don't have access to me and you want to know something, go to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. I'm so confident that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud has learned from me my teachings that you can ask him and more than likely his understanding will be just like mine. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is known as the start of the chain after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the teachings of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Yusuf as well as uh, Imam Muhammad uh, ibn Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah. So, Imam Muhammad, he became well known after he um, mastered the Islamic sciences. And he didn't suffice with his studies uh, with the people of Kufa. Rather, he wanted to go to different localities. And this is one unique feature of Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. They say that he is the one that merged. He is the one that merged Ahlul Ra'i or the people of Qiyas, uh, logical analysis in terms of the Islamic source text as well as the Athar. Athar refers to uh, the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as understood by the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So you have Hadith at the top and then you have Athar. So if we can't find something very clearly mentioned in Hadith or the Quran, then we refer to Athar. Athar refers to 
the understanding or the statements of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So he was, he was known, Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani was known to have merged the logical analysis of the people of Kufa in understanding the deen and merging the understanding or the statements of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and putting them together. So he taught in Baghdad and amongst his students was also the great jurist Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah. And as we will see in one of the slides, some of the statements of Imam al-Shafi regarding Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. So he has a very rich legacy. Imam Muhammad has a very rich legacy. Uh, he was appointed as judge by the ruler Harun al-Rashid. Now this was no ordinary merit. In order to be a judge in an Islamic uh, government where there are so many experts, and Imam Muhammad is appointed as the judge for the capital city of uh, the Islamic government. This shows how impressed the ruler was as well as the people who made the decision in reference to Imam Muhammad being the judge. He is known as the father of international Islamic law. And why is he known as the father of international Islamic law? If we study his books, we find that he's devised manuals for Muslims to practice the deen. For Muslims to practice the deen, and like many other experts, he goes from the concepts of aqidah and belief, to prayer, to business transactions, to social life, and then also inheritance and janazah and funeral. So he, he delves into all of these and he wrote manuals keeping in mind the relevance of the societies that Islam was being practiced. So where people were not speaking Arabic, where Islam was spreading into non-Muslim regions, he created manuals how to deal with non-Muslims, how to interact with those who don't believe, how to practice Islam in a non-Muslim society as a minority. He developed these things and this was one of the first of those works that he developed in some of these manuals in his books that he, uh, that he compiled. So this is why he is known as the father of international Islamic law. And he's written several books, Jamir al-Saghir, Jamir al-Kabir, uh, Zawaid, etc. He has a number of books and each book has its own unique perspective. But because we're talking about uh, his Mu'atta from, narrated from Imam Malik, as he narrated from Imam Malik, will will specifically speak about that. So he continued to serve as a judge. In between, he stepped down from his position. There are some reports that he was actually told to step down, but nevertheless, there was a period where he was not a judge. And it's mentioned by the historians that those years where he was not the judge, he, has the, he had the greatest impact. That's when the likes of Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, learned from Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani rahimahullah. So it was a, a number of years in between. And then again, he was appointed as, ju uh, as judge on the invitation of Harun al-Rashid, again, the ruler of the time, the head of state. And uh, he continued to serve in this field until he finally passed away. Now, there are some interesting stories about Imam Muhammad. I'll just mention a few. Uh, he talks about himself and he says, when my father passed away, I inherited 30,000 dirhams. And he says, 15,000 dirhams I spent on grammar and poetry. And the other 15,000 I spent on learning hadith and fiqh. Meaning that everything my father left, I spent it to acquire knowledge. I traveled, I purchased books, I engaged and I, I spent to learn. So for the language, for grammar and poetry, he learned that to master the Quranic sciences. Without the language, we can't master the Quran or the Hadith. And that's why it's important to learn Arabic. And then the fiqh and Hadith is obviously again to understand the jurisprudence, the background of the verses, the tafsir, etc. And that's how he spent the inheritance that was left for him by his father. He died, he passed away in the year 805, and it was the same year that Imam Kasa'i uh, passed away. And for the, those of us who know a little bit of Arabic grammar, will know that this is uh, 
uh, a great personality of Arabic grammar, Nahwa, what we call. So when Harun al-Rashid attended the funeral, this was the head of state, this was like the prime minister or the president of the time. When he attended the funeral of both Imam Kasai and also Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani, he made a beautiful statement. He said, today we have buried law and grammar. Why? Because they were known. These were masters of their fields. Right? Imam Muhammad was a master of his field of Islamic law. And uh, Imam Kasai was a master of Nahwa and grammar. And that's why uh, the statement was said that today we have buried side by side uh, grammar and law. Imam al-Shafi said about Imam Muhammad the following. So these are his words translated from the Arabic. I have not known a plump person. Why is Imam Muhammad known as a plump person? He was stout. Right? I have not known a plump person lighter of spirit than Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. I have not seen anyone more eloquent than him. And if we know Imam al-Shafi, he was very eloquent himself. His poetry is very well known. His diwan is, is available today as well in, in, in English. Uh, but his Arabic poetry is very well known. It shows his eloquence. So this is Imam al-Shafi talking about Imam Hassan, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani uh, in reference to his linguistic ability, his communication, his uh, ability to convey and, and communicate in the Arabic language. When he recited the Qur'an, I would think that the Qur'an was revealed in his language, meaning that Imam Muhammad was not a native Arab. He was not a native Arab. He was born in Iraq. So he had to learn the language. But when he mastered the language, when he would speak and when he would recite the Qur'an, it was as if it was natural to him, meaning he mastered uh, the language and the sciences of the Qur'an. I have never seen anyone more intelligent than Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah. So these are the words of Imam al-Shafi in reference to him. Couple of anecdotes here. Um, so at one occasion, so Imam Shafi narrates this. He says that I was with Imam Muhammad and someone came abruptly and asked a fiqh question. He asked a question about jurisprudence. Imam Muhammad responded. And the person who asked the question, he said, I disagree with you and I'm sure the fuqaha also disagree with you. I'm sure the jurist also disagree with you. So Imam Shafi said, and which jurist have you met? Because this is the best jurist that you just asked and you're disagreeing with him, right? Another uh, incident that is mentioned is about the arguments that took place with Imam Muhammad. So like any leader, like any personality who becomes well known, there are always those who throw sand. There are always those who throw mud. There are always those who look at some negatives. So Imam Muhammad was no different. So there were people who said all kinds of things about Imam Muhammad, maybe out of jealousy, out of spite, whatever it may be. And people would come and they would argue with him. Imam al-Shafi says, one thing I noticed about people is when you argue with people, they become irritated or you can tell that they're uncomfortable. But whenever people came to argue with Muhammad, he would respond in a very calm way, in a very decent way, smiling. And no matter what you would ask him to belittle him or to question him or to interrogate him, he would always be calm and collected. He would never be in rage or, or turn people away, etc. He was all, his face was always positive. His, you could see that he, he, he was sincere, even in responding to those who wanted to engage him in a negative manner. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal has a very great statement about uh, Muhammad. And what does he say? He said, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani rahimahullah is one of the greatest jurists. And he says that if he agrees with his two companions, then I would accept that opinion as my madhab. I would accept that opinion as my way, my opinion, my view. So they asked him, what do you mean by his two companions? He said, so he was referring to that if Imam Muhammad ever agrees with Imam Abu Hanifa as well as Imam Abu Yusuf, and they all agree on one opinion, on one view of a certain matter, then he said, I would accept that. 
So they asked him why. He said, Imam Muhammad is a man of jurisprudence and hadith. And Imam Abu Yusuf and Imam Abu Hanifa, they know the logical analysis. They know the qiyas and the ijtihad from the Quran and the hadith. So therefore, this is merging all three together. And therefore, I would take that as a reliable opinion for my own way. Many of the ulama, when they speak about Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, they give the example of bread. So to make a long story short, what they're talking about, the, the bread parable, is that in order for the bread to come in our presence, there's a lot of work that happens behind. So you have to have the grain, then you have to turn the grains into, into uh, the, the dough, and then it has to be uh, you know, cooked, and then finally the bread is with us. So the jurist and the ulama who speak about Imam Muhammad, they say that all the process of before the bread has been done by various ulama, scholars, imams, and jurists, fuqaha, etc. But the bread that actually was prepared for us, it was by Imam Muhammad. That's the work that he's done. He was able to put all that together and tell us this is the ruling and this is the source text for it, this is the hadith for it. So these are some anecdotes in reference to Imam Muhammad. Now coming to his book, Mu'atta. So as I said, he was a student of Imam Malik. After studying and mastering the sciences of uh, Islam from the Kufa, from the people of Kufa, he went to Medina. He spent three entire years in the presence of Imam Malik, listening to the Mu'atta several times, not once, but several times, and then again, reading it back to Imam Malik, rahimahullah. And he says this himself, that uh, without doubt, there were 700 narrations that I've mastered from my teacher, Imam Malik, rahimahullah. And he, like the other students, compiled the narrations that he had heard from Imam Malik in his own book. Now, his own book he named Mu'atta. Why? Because on the pattern of his teacher. He would teach this book in Kufa and there would be thousands of people just like the teacher, Imam Malik. So there were many people who could not travel from Kufa to Medina. But they, when they heard that Muhammad is now a master of the Mu'atta of Imam Malik, they would flock to Imam Muhammad to listen to the narrations that he had heard from his teacher Imam Malik. So that was the link there. And then he was as young as 20 when he was teaching in the Masjid of Kufa, which is the, one of the grand masjids in uh, the, the great city of Kufa at that time. People say that he not only filled our hearts but also our eyes. When Imam, Malik would, uh, Imam Muhammad would teach, he would teach so passionately that we would feel it in our hearts and many a times we would tear, we would get emotional. That's how we felt in the presence of these lessons that were being taught by Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. And Imam al-Shafi says this about the camel loads. He says, when we would leave Imam Muhammad learning from him, without doubt we were taking books, meaning that there's, it's a metaphor that we were taking so much knowledge with us that we could load it on camels. Others say it's not a metaphor, it's in a literal sense, meaning the notes we took in the presence of Imam Muhammad, they were so profound that there would be so many books that we would have to load them on our camels when we were returning back home. So what's the distinction of this book of his? Many books, they have what you call a chapter, and then you have sections. In Arabic you say bab or abwab, and then you say fasl or fusul. Fasl means the section, bab means the chapter. In this book of his, he only has chapters, he doesn't have sections. Now some of the later versions, they do have in some chapters, they have sections. But many scholars who study the legacy of Imam Muhammad, they say this was added by people who came after him. But if you look at the manuscripts and you look at the original Mu'atta of Imam Muhammad, you will not find fusul, you will not find sections, you'll only find chapters. Now why is this unique? Because he was able to hit the topic and bring the hadith, put his opinions in, as well as his other statements or athar from the companions or his other teachers, 
into the chapter. He, there was no need for him to make subsections and sections, again, making the book very long, etc. So this is one unique thing about his book. Uh, another thing is that unlike many other authors of his time, all the other Mu'attas, they would only narrate the hadith that they heard from Imam Malik that agreed with their opinion. But Imam Muhammad, rahimahullah, he narrated the hadith that he heard from Imam Malik which was against his own opinion. So he, what he does, and I'll, I'll show you a case example in a few uh, minutes inshallah. So what he does is, let's say he talks about a specific matter of prayer. He takes the narrations that he's heard from Imam Malik and even though it's not the opinion he agrees with, he records that narration which he heard from Imam Malik in his book. So it shows the justice of Imam Muhammad that I've heard this from Imam Malik even though I don't agree with my teacher in reference to this. And then he gives his opinion, his personal opinion, and then he narrates other narrations from other teachers and he puts it into the book to show that that is also a reliable reference and people can also practice that but this is my opinion and this is the reason why this is my opinion because of this narration or this report so this is also unique about the Mu'atta of Imam Muhammad so opposing narrations are included along with additional narrations to support his view okay now another thing is most of the books during his time whenever they would talk about their teachers, they would say حدثنا عن فلان that we've heard from so and so or سمعتو عن فلان I've personally heard this narration from so and so but in this particular book of his he changed the terminology and he used the word أخبرنا which basically means so and so has informed me so instead of the common حدثنا or سمعتو he used أخبرنا and what's the difference in this? A lot of scholars have gone into the details as to why he did this. But the most common understanding amongst uh, academics, they say that it's because when he says akhbarana, he refers to the fact that he not only heard this from his teacher, he also related this very narration to the teacher so that they could check it whether he has heard it correctly or not. And that's why he used this terminology akhbarana. And then um, there are some weak narrations that are found in the Mu'atta of Imam Malik. So he quotes those narrations and he also brings other narrations of the similar meaning in the book. And what does he do by this is that he strengthens the level of that narration. So even though Imam Malik's chain for that report may be weak, but he's heard that very same narration or a similar narration from another teacher which has a more reliable chain, which has a more reliable source, and therefore he strengthens that narration uh, that he's heard from Imam Malik. Okay, so I wanna do a little case study. There's a few sheets there. Maybe if someone can pass a few. I don't have as many, but maybe some to the sisters and some to the brothers. So this is the last part, and then we'll open for any Q&A, inshallah. This will probably take uh, about five minutes, inshallah. So basically, I've, um, I've taken out uh, a section to show the unique method that he does. So this is chapter 33 in his book. It's called Babu Iftitah is Salah, opening the Salah, the prayer, starting the prayer. So if you look at these narrations, uh, maybe you can share if there's not enough. Um, there's a number of narrations. Let's, let's look at the first one. So narration number 99. We're looking at narration of number 99. So it says here, Malik, Malik refers to who? Imam Malik. So Malik informed us, as Zuhri narrated to us from Salim ibn Abdullah ibn Umar that Abdullah ibn Umar said, radiallahu anhum, when he opened the prayer, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would raise his hands to his shoulders. And when he said Allahu Akbar for bowing, he would raise his hands, and when he raised his head from bowing, he would raise his hands. 
Then he would say, Sami'allahu liman hamida. Allah listens to whoever praises him. And then he would say, Rabbana lakal hamd, our Lord, and to you uh, belongs the praise. So if you notice this narration, it's talking about the Prophet ﷺ raising his hands at the beginning of salah, when going into ruku, raising your hands, when coming back from ruku, raising your hands, and when going down, raising your hands. He didn't follow this opinion. Imam Malik didn't, I mean, Imam Muhammad didn't follow this opinion. But look at his justice. He heard the narration from Imam Malik, so he therefore included it in his book. He didn't follow this opinion, yet he's included this in his book. Now all the other students of Imam Malik, if it opposed their personal opinion, they did not include that narration in the book, even though they heard it from Imam Malik. Are you, are you with me? Right? So this, this, this shows the uniqueness of Imam Muhammad. So there's a number of narrations that uh, repeat the same message in, according to different uh, reporters. But if you open now... Uh, page 81, which is the next page, and look at um, look at the middle of the page where it says Muhammad said. So uh, from 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, and 104, these are all narrations that he's heard from Imam Malik. Now he's putting his own opinion here. When he says Muhammad said, this refers to himself. He's saying, I am saying, the sunnah is that a man should say Allahu Akbar in his prayer whenever he lowers himself and whenever he raises himself. That means we're supposed to say Allahu Akbar every time we get from one posture to another. When he goes down into prostration, he should say Allahu Akbar. And when he goes down into the second prostration, he should say Allahu Akbar. As for raising the hands in the prayer, so this is his opinion. When, as for raising the hands in the prayer, he should raise his hands to his ears once only when beginning the prayer. So his personal opinion was to only raise your hands at the beginning and thereafter not raise your hand, right? After that, he should not raise them at all in the prayer. All of this is the verdict of Abu Hanifa. May Allah have mercy on him and concerning this, there are many narrations. And then he quotes, so 105, that's not a narration that he's heard from Imam Malik. That is a narration he's heard from somewhere, someone else. And then 106, all the way to the next page, 110. Okay, so you get the idea. Before his statement, in the middle of the page on 81, those are all the narrations he's heard from Imam Malik. And all of those narrations say, you're supposed to raise your hand whenever you go in any posture. Ruku, sujood, also when you come up from uh, ruku. But his personal opinion is that he doesn't do that. He only raises his hand at the beginning. And then he's quoting the narrations that he's following. Now, obviously, both these opinions are valid. Either one of them can be followed. It's just a matter of preference, right? And then again, we can get into all the details. Why is there preference? There's usul for it. There's principles according to one fiqh and, and uh, another fiqh, there's a different principle. Just to give a simple example, one of the distinctions is that what was the last practice of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So those who follow the opinion that you only raise your hands at the beginning, their, their verdict is that the Prophet Sallallahu final practice was only to raise his hands at the beginning. And where it says that he's raised his hands elsewhere, it was an initial practice, right? So another view is, no, that's not the case. It was the Prophet ﷺ wanted to raise his hands, but he had a garment over him. For example, when it was cold, he would put another sheet on top of the garment he was already wearing. So he wanted to raise his hands, but he didn't. Why? Because it was, he was wrapped around in, in, in something like a sheet or a blanket, so he couldn't raise his hands, or we couldn't see it. So you see how there's various perspectives. Again, both these perspectives are fine. You can follow each, any one you feel because they're all in narrations. It's just a matter of preference. It's just a matter of preference according to the various usul or the principles of fiqh. So I just wanted to show you that as a case study from his book. Finally, this is the last slide. So what are some of the lessons that you and I can take from 
uh, this little presentation on the Mu'atta of Imam Muhammad. We should always continue the legacy that has been sent to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are great personalities that did their job. They did what they had to. Now is our time. So we need to ask ourselves a question. What am I doing to forward the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So do whatever you can to propagate the message of Islam, to practice the message of Islam, to support those who spread the message of Islam. And you will be doing your part. We notice the passion of both Imam Malik as well as Imam Muhammad. That they were so dedicated, they were so passionate to do what they were doing despite their responsibilities. These people also had families, they also had work, they also had different commitments, but they took out time and they were very passionate. And that's why we see their legacy continues till today. A knowledge with relevance and application. From all the um, mu'attas, from the 30 mu'attas according to the exaggerated opinion, or the 16 mu'attas, we find only a few of them have become very popular. One is of Yahya al-Andalusi, who traveled to um, Spain, and uh, he narrated the hadith to the people there that he had heard from Imam Malik. And then one is the Mu'atta of Imam Muhammad. So the scholars say, why did these two copies or versions became, become very popular? It was very relevant to the time and to apply the knowledge. And that's why, again, as I said, Imam Muhammad's other works, such as his Kitab al-Athar, which talks about only fiqh, it talks about law. It was very applicable in the current period of time that he was living in. And people found it accessible. So this is what we need to do. We don't change the principles. We simply take those principles and make Islam relevant to today's time, to today's era. And we will see that it won't seem ancient. It won't seem backwards. It's just that we have those principles and it's very broad. There's a lot of flexibility. We take those principles, we take those usuls and we apply them and we will see that Islam is relevant and will be relevant to our societies and our communities. Sincere efforts always flourish. So one outstanding quality is that they were sincere. In fact, in the biography of Imam Malik I was reading earlier today, uh, there were many people who came to Imam Malik and they told him that other, others are trying to compile what you are doing, what you have been doing. So he said, show me some of those. And uh, he saw some of them and he said, MashaAllah, may Allah make this prosper. But the people came back after his mu'atta became very well known and flourished and they said, it's a sign of your sincerity, that's what's made this flourish. Right? So again, sincere efforts, they flourish, they grow. They, they become something that is accepted. And then we find um, improve on the work of others. Imam Muhammad didn't reject the work of Imam Malik, even though he disagreed with him on certain opinions. He acknowledged him for his great work. He reported hadith from him. And he, if you look at all of these narrations in his book, uh, at the beginning of every chapter, it's from Malik, I've heard so and so. And then, even though he's differed in various areas, he still quotes him, he still respects him, but he advances his work. He takes it forward, makes it applicable to his community, to his society, and that is what we need to do. There's a legacy, there's great work that others do. We should not shun it or look down upon it. We should acknowledge it, we should respect it. If we have a different perspective, move it forward in, in the way that you feel that it would benefit others. And make a difference no matter how small. So Imam Muhammad didn't realize that his work will be so great. You know, I have a translation of Imam Malik's work and uh, it was translated in English. And I, I've been told that there's some efforts going on to be translated in, in Spanish. Right? It's already been translated in many other languages, but English and Spanish. So Imam Muhammad didn't know that his book will be translated and will be benefited to so many people, right? But it started with making a small difference. So if we all do our little part, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make our um, uh, work prosper and grow. And finally, we've spoken about this great book, 
have access to the book. I'm sure there's a copy in the library here. And uh, have a look at it, read it, see the great work that these great personalities have brought forward. And inshallah, be inspired and change yourselves, transform ourselves for today's time, inshallah. So this concludes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts and bless each and every one of you for sitting and listening to uh, whatever I had to say. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer a few questions and inshallah we can conclude. Yes. So there are narrations, as we said, of both. So if you do practice raising the hands, then make the intention that you're following the sunnah and you will get the rewards. Right? You will get the rewards. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, there, is a, there are a few, but the, the best one is, is the one I have here. It's uh, by Torath uh, Publications. So if it's even on Amazon, it's, it's, it's everywhere, right? So uh, Torath is T-U-R-A-T-H, Torath Publications. Any other questions? Yes, brother. Alaikum <laughs> salam. Yes. Yeah, so Sheikh Idris al Khandalwi, rahimahullah, he has written a sharah. He has written an explanation for this book. And um, in fact, in the English version, the entire introduction of uh, uh, Sheikh Idris al Khandalwi is, is translated at the, at the beginning of this book. Uh, so he's done some great work, Sheikh Idris al Khandalwi. He's, he's written many books, and a lot of his works have been translated too. So um, I'm not sure why the forces, the British forces, hated him. Okay, Abdul Hay Naklawi. His name also comes up in, in reference to this as well. That uh, he's, he's written some explanation of uh, Imam Muhammad's Mu'atta. So I, I don't know the details of uh, what the enmity was between the British and him, but he has he has written some some explanations. There's a number of shuruhat. There's a number of uh, explanations for this work. What they've done is they've done tahqiq of every narration. That means every narration of Imam Muhammad's. They've looked into who those narrators are what their authenticity is and how reliable they are. And those who really are interested in this, they even go into what narration is mursal, what narration, narration is mawquf. Mursal basically means where Imam Malik said, I've heard this uh, from my teacher. And then he says the narration. He doesn't link it up back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they've gone to, to, to the depths of that. And then mawquf is basically where you just quote the Sahabi. You just say, Ibn Umar said this, but really it was the Prophet ﷺ who said this. So they, 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 pulled the, they put the full narration, the full chain of the narration there. So in some of the works uh, you do find this. There are a number of shuruhat. In fact, one of the Imams of Mecca uh, back in the days has written a book in reference to this as well with the tahqiq of every narration. Any other questions? Yes. So Imam Muhammad, he wrote this himself. But when he quotes his opinions, he does give reference to some of the opinions that are in agreement with Imam Abu Hanifa. But as I said earlier, that there are many opinions of Imam Muhammad where he disagrees with his teacher. So um, he made make a mention of that at times, that uh, this is not the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, but it's my opinion. Or he gives reference to Imam Abu Yusuf, right? Uh, so some of the opinions will be in accordance to Imam Abu Hanifa, but not all. Not all, yeah. In his other work, Jami al Sagir or Jami al Kabir or Kitab al Athar, he actually points out those differences.
he points out every difference that he has with both Imam Abu Yusuf as well as Imam Abu Hanifa. That's it? Okay. Allah bless everybody, inshallah. Jazakum khair.